So we are lucky to have with us Ramon Jacobson, uh, who joined uh, local initiative support corporation LISC uh, DC in 1988, 1998, excuse me, <laughs> um, and currently serves as acting director. He manages LISC's portfolio in the District of Columbia and oversees all aspects of community development lending, including underwriting, structuring, loan closing, inspections, disbursements, and repayment. Uh, LISC, DC, LISC DC has been am among the top investment sites of the organization's 30 plus local programs across the nation. Jacobson has managed more than $300 million in community development financial institutions, fund investments, CDFI, um, loans, grants, and tax credit equity in every neighborhood in the District of Columbia. Uh, these investments in affordable home ownership, rental housing, commercial and retail properties, as well as community facilities, uh, help to transform desperately poor neighborhoods while preserving economic diversity and other neighborhoods going, uh, under, undergoing broad gentrification. Uh, Jacobson began his career working in the notorious New York City shelter system of the 1980s, uh, developing programs to get single adults off the streets in the midst of a deadly cold snap. Uh, he helped um, as consultant do groundwork for the Corporation for Supportive Housing and worked with CHS in the Twin Cities, uh, and he holds a BA from Harvard and an MBA from the Yale School of Management. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Ramon Jacobson. Thanks. Thanks. That was a little too much ado. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, we understand what time of day it is and what day of the week it is, and we're about to hit with Nor'easter. So we're going to try to get to the meat quickly. But I want to make sure um, that we are in the right place. I think we're the panel talking about things that we are doing and can do to preserve the right to the city, to make the city inclusive for all. So I want to mention a few names. And I wrote them down, and now I'll probably forget what they are. But, um, I want to mention people you probably haven't heard of, because I could walk you through a spreadsheet of like, Lisk has invested 145 million east of the river, and we've been around since 82, and we've done you know thousands of units, but I don't think you care about that. But you might be interested in hearing about Miss Cobb. She and her family uh, bought their house in about 1945 in a neighborhood not far from here. She's in her 60s and has some physical limitations. And you know the rain always falls in D.C. and it eventually compromises your ceiling, your roof, and 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 then starts degrading the physical structure of all these houses. So, you know, east of the river, everything was built around the end of the war uh, or during it. Um, so a, a nonprofit we worked with called Yahad, Yahad. I'm saying that wrong, I'm sure, but um, they were able using some grant money we provided to uh, renovate her house, basically. And it was a simple thing, right? basic stuff, appliances, cabinets, bathrooms. She's going to be there for the, for the, the next, she's, she's retained her right to the city. That was done with private dollars, volunteers, no government um, support. Um, and it's, it's an important reminder that we still can do affect this change. And then I want to tell you about Mr. King and Ms. Scott. They, um, they had that dream everybody had in about 2005, tenant association. Buildings going up for sale, prices are going up, and they decide they're going to buy their building. So we helped them. Tenant association deal. Martha Davis in the audience knows we do this work all the time. Co-ops in those days were an option, but so were condominiums because banks were handing out mortgages like they were free mints at a at a restaurant. Um, so that when the bubble popped, these folks were left with the shell of a house, the shell of an apartment building, 13 units, couldn't be fixed. Roof has still been leaking. He miraculously got, ran an extension cord and a sump pump to the, put it on the roof to keep it, to keep it from sinking. So working with him, supporting him, working with nonprofits like Building Community Workshop and a, a development consultant, they um, secured city money to fix up that building. Construction starts in a few weeks. They've been waiting 10 years in the, in the unit where everybody left but four people in a neighborhood where they had a mass shooting, what, five years, five, six years ago. They, Mr. King and Ms. Scott, I said, why are you staying here? They met with our CEO. He said, we love this neighborhood. We love this community. That's, those people have a, a, a right to the city, and they're, work, they're pursuing it. Then I want to tell you about some nonprofit leaders we work with. Um, Patty Stonecipher, Kelly Sweeney McShane, George Brown. All three of them run these nonprofits that got their start in Shaw, Columbia Heights, um, Adams Morgan. And they saw how the demographics were changing, and they, want, they said, we've got to, if we're going to serve this population, if we're going to help these people find a safety net that sustains them and a, a ladder to prosperity, 
they're going to have to relocate. So we've invested um, with Kelly, we invested in their, some affordable housing, and we invested uh, $25 million in a state-of-the-art health clinic that's been open uh, in the Bellevue neighborhood. With uh, George, he's building a $35 million new facility with comprehensive support services on Good Hope Road, for, called you know, Bradford City's East of the River uh, Center. And Patty Stonecipher, who came from Microsoft, took uh, Martha's table, and you know, they're doing integrated child care, food, uh, groceries. My, my daughter's walked in. She helped out at a farmer's market a couple weeks ago, uh, handing out free, free vegetables to folks so that people can sustain themselves and grow in these communities where they already are. And then finally, I got to mention uh, my boss, Ormetta Newsom, whose record, voice is recorded, excuse me, whose voice is recorded in the museum, thanks to Samir and the people at the museum. She got involved in this crazy idea when, an arch when, a, when a guy working at the building museum was pat noticed that they, were, then they built a new bridge across the Anacostia that they left behind the piers. And he said, you know, Scott was like, I think we can build a park on that. And this Ormenta, you know, who's a visionary in many ways, said, that's crazy. Here's $10,000. Let's see what you can do with the idea. Design it. So that led to an initiative um, that to build a bridge, which we hope, I think, will one day mean people from these various income levels will sit side by side looking at the sunset. But it also was, it launched a broader equity, devel equitable development planning process kind of a model nationally for how you get the community to say, these are some goals that we have for this small area within a mile walk of the bridge and how we can dig our roots into there. We've invested, uh, we, we set a $50 million investment goal. We're now, I think, next week, if our loan gets approved, we'll be at $42 million, which is not enough, but it's a lot more than we thought we would be. And um, yeah, so in a phone booth, if you'd like to listen to Ormenta talking about the city, she, you can dial four and listen to her voice, so that's great. But that's enough about me, and that sets the mood that we're doing serious work and we're making progress. We have a great panel of people from across the country talking, and from our own neighborhoods talking to us about housing, justice, um, and the broader question of how we are building, developing a social fabric that will ensure that we can retain the rights to the communities that we all cherish. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, our first panelist, who's Amanda, who's going to, uh, all the panelists are going to introduce themselves and to give, use their eight minutes to talk about what they're up to. Great. Good use of time. All right. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Actually, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I know it's late, but it's good to hear your voices. Uh, so I am coming from Detroit. I run the Detroit Justice Center. And I feel like I come from the most narrated city in the country. So everywhere I go, uh, you know, people have uh, not really questions, but thoughts and opinions about Detroit uh, based on news coverage from afar. And um, the thing, the, the question I hear most often is, you know, Detroit is doing better now, right? <laughs> Which is really hard to deal with because uh, living there uh, feels very complicated. And I want to give you a more nuanced picture of what's happening there. So I moved home to Michigan about five and a half years ago, um, and that was to serve families divided by the prison system. And uh, Detroit was about to file the largest ever municipal bankruptcy. And um, as Scott pointed out earlier, I moved home and it was, uh, I was not living under a uh, democracy. We were under emer emergency financial management, which meant that the city council could adjourn meetings and close meetings, but not take any uh, substantive decisions. Um, at that point of the bankruptcy, it was interesting to me, people couldn't seem to decide if Detroit was 50 years ahead of the rest of the country or 50 years behind. And the way that I answer that, it's clear to me that we're 50 years ahead. And not because the rest of the country is going to have to go through, you know, the bottoming out of American capitalism the way that Detroit has, but because we've learned certain strategies about how to build a social fabric, how to care for each other, that I think can be incredibly instructive to the rest of the country. So I want to talk, before I get into all the visionary work um, that I'm honored to be part of and to work alongside, I just want to you know, give a sense of what we're up against. So Detroit, at a glance, um, you know, things are not better for the majority of Detroiters, the black majority, the 83% black majority in Detroit. Um, there's been really rapid redevelopment. So probably what you've heard about in the headlines is this seven square miles downtown. Um, where Dan Gilbert owns 100 buildings. 
Um, but it's a you know, vast city, 134 square mile city, um, where um, you know, people are you know, spread out, and that's where it still looks pretty bleak. So 60% of our children live in poverty. One in four homes were subject to tax foreclosure between 2011 and 2015. So as you heard earlier, after the subprime mortgage crisis, we had our second wave of foreclosures. And these were people who owned their homes outright, um, but were being over-assessed on their property taxes and then went on, went on to lose those homes. More than 200,000 Detroiters have had their water shut off because they were behind on bills. So there are people without running water in our city. And we're the unhealthiest city in the country with sky-high asthma rates in many neighborhoods. And our school system and public defender system are in shambles. So what's going on here? Um, the quick version, um, you know, we've had an extreme version of what we've seen in many other cities um, across the US. So an extreme retraction of the state and of public services. So for um, a very long time there, um, you know, the, you, these core welfare functions were not being provided. So um, you know, public education, keeping street lights on, um, providing access to safe drinking water, indigent legal services, trash collection, maintaining parks. And yet at the same time, there was an expansion of um, the, the forms of the state that criminalize and punish. So um, you know, there was still investment going on in policing, prosecuting, and caging mostly black people. Um, so if you were looking for the state in terms of you know, educating your child adequately, or keeping your water turned on, it would be hard to find. And yet they would find you if CPS wanted to take your children away because your house was now deemed neglectful. Or if they wanted to serve you a warrant for outstanding parking tickets or whatever it was. So um, Detroit shows us how deeply um, connected questions of economic justice and criminal justice really are. So that our fight for economic justice so, is so often a fight against mass incarceration and the ways in which we need to link these things. Um, and, and the ways in which economic fights are so often fights about who we deem criminal and who we cast out of our communities. So let me give an example. Um, it's a felony under Michigan state law to reconnect your water or your neighbor's water once it's been uh, shut off. So um, you know, families who are facing uh, dehydration, illness, stigma because of not having clean water and who want to reconnect it can be um, prosecuted if they try to reconnect it with a malicious destruction of utility property, which carries a five-year penalty. Um, so, you know, and one in five homes in some neighborhoods had their water shut off last year. So, um, you know, again, these families will have a hard time finding supportive services, but they will find you and prosecute you um, if you try to reconnect to your water. So our fight for water is one more fight, um, you know, one more uh, you know, front in this fight against mass incarceration. So in spite of this uh, brief but bleak um, you know, set of stats, um, the legendary activist who I, I love that she's become a star today, Grace Lee Boggs, um, a star alongside um, you know, the, the names of many black women organizers who have been lifted up today. But Grace Lee Boggs, before she passed, she said a few years ago, I feel sorry for people who don't live in Detroit. Hmm. So why would she say that? Um, so at the core of her philosophy, um, which she developed over the course of eight decades in Detroit, um, she talked about visionary organizing, and if you break that down, there's three main things there. So it's the value of visionary organizing is that it's not just about what we're tearing down or what we're fighting against, it's the visions that we're building towards. And so she would talk about solutionaries um, mm -hmm. in Detroit. Um, it was the value of place-based organizing that is deeply rooted in community and in place. And finally, it's the value of building human connections that put technology at the service of human needs as opposed to the opposite. So I think Grace Lee Boggs is influenced, but also we um, you know, have the benefit of being Rosa Parks' place where, that she moved to after she could not find a job after taking a stand in Montgomery. Um, we had you know, many generations of strong black women organizers um, who in many ways um, gave rise to visionary organizing on several fronts. So I'll just lift up some of the examples of what's happening. So, um, you know, neighbors in Detroit, um, for a very long time, they saw grocery stores leaving, but they didn't want to leave. And so they figured out, we need to build a local sustainable food system. We need to be able to feed ourselves. So we are decades ahead of the curve in terms of urban agriculture. And the beautiful thing is that it's not just the, you know, the farming itself or the local food system. It's actually um, you know, a philosophical commitment to um, food sovereignty and black food sovereignty. So the work that, again, you heard about earlier with the Detroit 
um, Black Community Food Security Network. Um, and then Food Lab is an organization that's building a network of um, mostly people of color led food businesses um, that are you know, creating a real ecosystem um, for local food businesses. 40% of Detroiters do not have access to the internet. And so um, there are organizations like the Detroit Community Technology Project that have the Equitable Internet Initiative um, that have created um, local neighborhood-based um, internet mesh networks. So they said even though the, the large telecoms have not seen this infrastructure worth investing in, in our neighborhoods, we will build it and we will train up digital stewards um, to deliver and train people on um, technology. Um, Solidarity is another organization um, in Highland Park um, that has been working on community solar projects, particularly in areas that lost um, you know, street lighting for a very long time. And they said, we don't just want energy independence, we want energy democracy, which they describe as the idea that people most impacted by energy decisions should have the greatest say in shaping those decisions. Again, these types of things that are urgent questions across the country that Detroiters um, now have practice at working through. Um, Place-based education. So the James and Grace Lee Boggs School has been working on um, deeply rooted place-based education to shift the idea of success. And this has been mentioned several times today. Um, you know, away from successful as being how far away can you grow up and get from, from Detroit. And instead, success as being how deeply rooted and committed can you be to beloved community. Um, we have water warriors. So, um, you know, the Flint water crisis, the lead in the water has received a lot of national attention. Um, but before that, we had and still ongoing the water shutoffs in Detroit. And so um, this, again, is one of many struggles that we have um, you know, become quite refined in dealing with in Detroit, but is coming to so many cities. So studies have come out that said that you know, water is going to be unaffordable for people in many cities. Other cities are facing water shutoffs. And uh, in Detroit, they're fighting for water affordability. They're fighting for water as a human right. And so I want to lift up the work of Monica Lewis-Patrick and We the People of Detroit. I think if water um, you know, becomes affordable and a human right in this country, it will be because of women like Monica who are organizing around this. Um, so we've been organizing with some very you know, high stakes questions and high stakes problems in Detroit. Those are just a couple of the you know, fronts that people are working on and developing visions around. Um, but I'm you know, in community meetings regularly where people are thinking about how do we become healthy individuals who can build healthy communities? And how do we become more open-hearted individuals who can build just communities? And um, I founded the Detroit Justice Center to, um, as community lawyers, show up for some of this organizing that's been going on. And so we have a three-pronged approach that I call defense, offense, and dreaming because I think we need defense and offense, but we need the dreaming also under one roof. And so um, the defense piece is we have legal services. Um, we help people. I saw the ways that Detroit families were being shut out by um, you know, warrants, fines, fees, tickets, suspended licenses, nights in jail because they couldn't bail out their loved ones, all of these things, all these ways that mass incarceration has also made cities, um, also forced people to be shut out of cities. And so we meet, meet people where they're at and provide those types of legal services. Our um, economic equity practice goes on offense and assuring up um, some of these community exper experiments, so community land trust, um, limited, limited equity co-ops, uh, small businesses led by returning citizens, um, other economic solutions. And then we have a Just City Innovation Lab, which is where we dream. Um, so I'd be happy to talk more about that and some of the questions, um, but I'll, I'll leave it at that because I've probably taken more than enough time. Um, yeah, I mean, you'll leave us hanging with the dreaming, but um, I guess I think somebody will want to discuss. Um, okay, that's wonderful. Um, thanks for introducing all these topics. Um, Gloria, do you want to talk, tell us about the Bay Area? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I'm so so glad to be here today. So glad to have been invited by Samir and, and to be here um, this afternoon. And I'm sorry to disappoint some of you that I am not a real Oaklander. I've <laughs> only lived there for 13 years. But I am particularly proud to be coming back here because I am a DC area native, born in Tacoma Park, raised in Hyattsville. My mom, who's here, is still a proud, proud resident of PG County. Um, and I'm weaving my bio into my, my talk a little bit, and I'm going to start with just a, a little anecdote about what it means to do this work in Oakland, be from here, et cetera. So there's a, there's a place in San Francisco called 826 Valencia, 
It's on Valencia Street in the Mission District, which you've heard about today, kind of ground zero for displacement of Latinx folks in, in San Francisco. And 826 Valencia, um, it does some great things. It's, uh, it does literary programs for kids. Um, but how most people know it is through the front storefront, which is a pirate store. It's a pirate store. You can go and you can buy eye patches, you can buy books of sea ch chanties, and all these things that are totally ridiculous. And like so many trappings of gentrification, it's both absurd and also strangely appealing. Um, and um, when I came back to visit DC a few years ago, and I was just kind of scrolling through, and I was like, you know, seeing where to go, <clears throat> my wife and I had a little bit of downtime. I said, oh, there's an 826 DC. And I was like, babe, let's go there. Let's go see what they have instead of a pirate shop. Let's go to 826 DC. So we go to the Columbia Heights Metro, which was exciting enough, because when I grew up here, there was no Columbia Heights Metro. We go, we go to 826 DC, and it's not a pirate store. It's a whatever it is, it's a magic store or something like that. Like, this is so cute. We go down the street. We go eat at the vegan cafe, which I'm very excited about because I'm vegetarian. And all of a sudden, I'm eating at the vegan cafe, and I say to my wife, I just realized we're like three blocks from where my dad is from and it's totally unrecognizable. Believe me, there were no vegan cafes or magic stores <laughs> in that neighborhood when my dad, my late father, was growing up there. And it just, when I come back here, I experience that disorientation of the shift of the city in a sharp way that folks who are from Oakland or from here are experience on the daily, right? And so it's, just, it's an interesting thing to be jerked back and forth. Um, in that, and an interesting thing to see the commonalities between what we see here in our nation's capital and out on the West Coast. And, <clears throat> you know, we're driven, my organization, East Bay Housing Organizations, we're a member-driven organization. We do advocacy and organizing for affordable housing, and we very much position um, housing as a human right as part of the civil rights struggle, as you've heard about so much today. And it's particularly interesting to be doing that on the West Coast where although there is a long history stretching back to the removal and colonization of indigenous peoples, there is a long history of oppression and segregation. But the fact of residential segregation as we experience it now in the city was not a given in California cities. It, was, it had to be consciously created after black folks started to arrive in significant numbers during World War II. It was not a given that the black-white se segregation of the Northeast and the Midwest would be recreated in California. But in the book, The Color of Law, spells this out very explicitly. Government and realtors and individuals made sure that those segregationist patterns would be replicated in California, where in fact they did not have to be. And it's, it's just a really interesting and heartbreaking thing that in our work to create more affordable housing, I believe we are consciously trying to redress that, um, but doing a lot of uphill work to do that, especially since um, this pattern of segregation was established around World War II through that job boom. And then we've had several waves of employment boom since. Of course, we have the latest tech wave right now. One thing that is significantly different in the Bay Area is the role of tech. Um, and even though, you know, where I work, we're about an hour from Silicon Valley, but we all very much feel it. I live near a, a BART station. BART is our version of Metro. Um, where both Google buses and Mountain View shuttles are pulling out every day to drive the hour and a half. Um, down to, to Mountain View and Apple headquarters and to Google headquarters. That's the same BART station where a few months ago I got off the BART with my kids, taking them home from preschool, and we walked right into the impromptu vigil that was being held for Neil Wilson, a black woman who was stabbed fatally by a mentally ill white man on that platform. Um, and all of that just exists in this neighborhood um, where I live now a neighborhood in a region that has been shaped by the fact that we have created 450,000 jobs over the last decade, but only built 45,000 homes. So just do the math with that. So what my organization has done for the last 30 years is very much fought to promote the creation of more affordable housing. And I say specifically, I'm not saying public housing. I'm mostly talking about, when I say affordable housing, in my sense, I'm mostly talking about nonprofit housing um, of the type that LISC promotes. Um, which is mostly built through actually a Republican supported and created uh, tax credit. Um, but I'm happy to, take the, happy to take the impact of that because <laughs> it's, it's stably housed thousands and thousands of people outside of the speculative market. And we've done a lot of work to promote this kind of housing in exclusionary communities, particularly in the suburbs. 
My organization, East Bay Housing Organizations, we don't just work in Oakland, we work in Berkeley, which is right next door, and across two counties, which are known as the East Bay, which, which um, are home to about three million residents just east of San Francisco. So we've done a lot of this work um, in the suburbs to um, convince city councils and, and, public, um, and the public that it's okay to build affordable housing, it's not gonna destroy your city, in fact, it's gonna enhance your city. Um, <clears throat> but in all of this work that we were doing, something started to happen and shift, which is that we had to do all this work in the suburbs to get them to accept affordable housing. And then all of a sudden, people started to rediscover the urban core in Oakland and Berkeley, um, in certain parts of San Francisco and Richmond. And what I realized when I came into leadership of this organization is that the industry of affordable housing had gotten very good at using messaging to convince folks in the suburbs and in certain neighborhoods in the cities not to be afraid of affordable housing um, and was advancing racial justice but without talking about it as racial justice. In fact, explicitly scrubbing race out of that conversation so as to be able to do this work in exclusionary communities. And we are now at a moment where we realize that model has run its course. And so we now have to, especially in today's politicized environment, we have to figure out how do we advance housing as a human right while saying that's what we're doing, housing as racial justice while saying that's what we're doing, um, which frankly freaks some people out, freaks some people out big time. Um, and, and so we are being forced to be more intersectional in, in our work by the scale of the displacement crisis in Oakland and beyond, and also by the fact that about a decade ago, we started doing direct uh, community organizing, training and leadership empowerment with residents of affordable housing, who themselves are living proof that if you give people stable homes outside of the speculative market, they can and will civically engage. They can and will want nice things in their neighborhood and patronize businesses. They can and will take care of their homes as they were already doing. But you know what? I mean, I'm a homeowner in Oakland. I can tell you something. My windowsills are constantly dirty. You know why? Okay, it's, it's partly because I'm a bad housekeeper. Whatever, I have two little kids. But it's because I live a quarter mile from a freeway. I can scrub my windowsill all day long and it will still be black at the end of the day because I live a quarter mile from a freeway. So this is not about individual housekeeping habits. This is about land use and how it plays out. And these um, older, mostly older black women, again, that we organize in our program, they know all this and they share their lived, not just their lived experience, but their lived expertise and they are able to do so because of their stable housing. And just a, a few other things that we've been able to do with them. Um, one is that we have worked with a lot of organizations across the region, some of which you've heard of already today, uh, to establish this idea of that we need the three Ps when it comes to housing. We need to protect, preserve, and produce affordable homes. Now in the Bay Area and in California, the idea of producing affordable homes has become very fashionable. Everybody's down with now building more housing and building more affordable housing. But that, those ideas of protecting and preserving, when you're talking about what we heard on the last panel, actually organizing around tenants' rights, that's where it gets really deep because then you are challenging some ideas about property rights, about real estate, and that's where it gets really deep. And we are starting to do that and we're actually organizing around a couple of ballot measures um, to, to uh, not just build housing but also to expand tenant rights in California. And it is a, that latter one is a brutal battle, let me tell you. Um, so I, I could go on and on, but I think the last thing I'll... I'll, I can get back to things later in questions, um, and I'd love to talk about the intersection of criminal justice and formerly incarcerated folks and affordable housing, because that's complicated. But there was a question from someone in the audience, I think that the young woman who was a city councilor in Madison, thank you for doing that work, I would never do that, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so young too, my goodness, how did you recover? So you asked kind of what, you know, what folks can do. And I really think it's about who are you voting for and what are you voting for? And I'm not just talking about for Congress because in California, all of our electeds are Democrats. All of them in the coastal cities are Democrats. But at the end of the day, are you voting like a member of the prop property class? And are you voting to uphold the tax breaks and the exclusion and the idea that property rights and your right as a landlord or a homeowner trump everything else? Choice of words intentional. What are you voting for? And so that's why we're working on several ballot measures that specifically will challenge those ideas. So I could say more, but I'll leave it there. Oh, all right, thanks. Yeah. I mean, that, that raises so many questions. I, I have um, my mom's side, the, the Mexican side, um, the relatives I have, or, you know, they're all from East Bay, Berkeley, Martinez, mm -hmm. Richmond. 
Albany, and uh, you know they immigrated in 1925, so they are the landed class. And I think one of the things you know Dominic maybe has encountered as well as as we have is you do have these neighborhoods with minority homeowners, and they are a, a population who's also very concerned about wealth building. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, we're trying to produce this housing. It's a it's a challenge to respect that um, that interest as well. But I like what you said about how to vote. Um, Dominic's got many accolades and, and deep roots in this city. Um, I'd like to think of him as the, as the man who I worked with to bring a Maggie Moose ice cream to U Street. <laughs> it was a short-term investment, but at least we all got out. <laughs> but, but, but no talk about Maggie Moose today. Don't talk about Maggie Moose today. Uh, I think uh, Samir brought me here to, to step on some toes. I'm a, to step on some toes. Feel free. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm teasing Samir. Thank you, Samir, because what I'm focusing on in this section is the part that I know Samir and I talked about, and that is how do we create just cities? So 1DC stands for Organizing Neighborhood Equity, and our mission is to exercise the political strength to create and preserve economic and racial equity. And so just to give you a little bit of context, when our organization looks at making the just city, we frame it, and the way we frame our work, our work is done in what they call a human rights context. So whether you have rent, we believe you have a right to housing. Whether you are in the government and the, are a part of the government's redevelopment land agency, we believe because you are a citizen, you have a right to say what happens to the land in your neighborhood. And when it comes to labor and work, we're interested in building your power as a human being to control your labor and work so your labor and work is dignified and respectful according to your values. And then when it comes to health and wellness, once again, if you don't have Medicaid or any medical plan in a civilized society, we believe you should have a right to health and wellness. So that's the frame we're coming from. So think about it this way. What do we believe and practice as a community in making a just city? And do we really believe that the people who are disenfranchised, people who are oppressed, people who have the power of the structure on their neck, do they have the right to the city? Or do we believe what I said at the International Conference on Social Housing in New York City about three weeks ago, I said, we practice people who have a right to the city based on what they could pay for. If you can pay for rent, you can stay here. In Flint, Michigan, if you need clean water, but it's exorbitantly expensive, you know, can you have a right to water? In Baltimore two years ago, a bg and &E increased the electric bill 400%. Do you have a right to electricity? So, so these are the questions that I think that I'm looking forward to us troubling in this part of the, the conversation, and I'm gonna keep my comments short because here is the context of why 1DC joined the Right to the City Alliance, because the Right to the City Alliance is not just about housing and land, right? It's about resources, it's about wellness, it's about having access to clean water, to a clean environment, to adequate education, right? And so given the fact that we know in most major cities like D.C., not only is there displacement, it's what Mindy Fully Love calls serial displacement. And people are being moved over and over again, and their housing and their labor is becoming more precarious. So what does one D.C. want to do about that? So the vision that we have is that people build power, and we do that in two ways with them deep relationship building. That's one of the things that we have to dream about for the future is that we have to build communities and relationships that go very deep. 
And in those relationships, what we're doing is respecting people's capacity to lead. So another thing that One DC wants to do is leadership development, right? Because we are organizers. So what gets confusing sometimes is people ask us, what do we do? Yes, we do the housing work, we do the labor work, we do the health work, but the real work is relationship building and building leaders, and that's why we're losing, right? We will never win until we build powerful relationships with people and build leaders who continually control their community and we nurture those people and we build those people up with more skills because they have skills, right? But like me and all of us in this room, somebody is nurturing our skills to get us to the next level, right? And so the next level is this. The reason why I'm talking about relationship building and leadership development is because you cannot be a part of a right to the city movement without political education and popular education. You cannot be a part of what One DC is a part of. We're part of a cooperative movement. And we're talking about cooperative in all forms, whether it's working with We Act Radio on a, a com commercial uh, small business retail development, or if it's helping the residents with Empower DC at Bird Farms to buy part of the land and create a housing co-op, whether it's a childcare co-op, which we're working on with Latinx, or it's a, a cleaning co-op, which we're working on with Latinx. But the point is that all of this is grounded, right, in our mission around racial and economic and gender equity. And it builds up from, the, from that platform and from that base. And that's how we believe you can get to a just city. Because in order to get to that just city, you have to acknowledge that all of us are participating in the unjust structure Right, that is not about individuals, it's about a system, right? And cities are about systems. So in order to create a new city, we have to create new systems and a new visions. And I wanna end with this. Next year will be my 33rd year b being on the corner in DC, being an organizer. So I was here when Valley Green was torn down. I was here when Ellen Wilson was torn down. I was here when Berry Farms is being torn down right now. I was here when Arthur Cape was, was torn down. And I'm here as they plan to tear down Park Morton and Greenleaf. So just think about this. If all of us lived in those communities, what would we be feeling, right? What would we need? We will need people to work with us, to respect us, to build relationships with us, to enhance our power, to lead our vision for a just city. And so the components of that, again, is like what Rosemary talked about, is that there's no way to get this without rent strikes. There's no way to get this without uh, coalition building and tenant unions. And there's, no, and there's no way to get this without limited equity co-ops and land trusts. Because as we know, if you're black in America, Latinx or immigrant, your income does not rise with the tide, right? And that's what we try to remind people, right? Um, I'll conclude with this statement. Pat Buchanan once said that the health care system in the United States was great because he could afford it, right? But my last name and your last name is not Buchanan, right? And so therefore, if we want a just city, anybody with any type of name should have access to health care. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Feel free. Um, well, this is good. We have two hot, very hot market speakers, and, and I think two from cities that have different challenges, um, different stages of the economic cycle. Judge Pratt is uh, formerly the chief judge of the, of, um, the okay, and also uh, formerly of Rutgers, and, and has done some amazing work on alternative sentencing. I want to hear what she has to say. The green monster is what they used to call, the, or sometimes they still call it, the green monster. Is what they call, unaffectionately, the citizens call the Newark Municipal Court. Imagine the place that is supposed to be dispensing justice that's located on Green Street is seen as a monster by the people that it's supposed to serve. One of our community providers who spent about 30 years in and out of state prison and in and out of Newark Municipal Court and the city jail, because the court also sits over the city jail, said Newark Municipal Court was probably one of the worst places you wanted to be. You got no respect from the judges, from the officers. You didn't want to get locked up there. 
the bathroom was flooded, there was, you were in a cell with a person that was dope sick, going through problems, and the police just didn't care. The green monster uh, consumed, feasted on thousands of people each year. People who would be arrested, charged, released, then rearrested for failing to appear to court for issues that they had or for failing to pay fines and costs that were imposed. You know, the low-hanging fruit, the drug-addicted prostitute, the low-level drug dealer, the troubled young person, the schizophrenic homeless person that lives at Newark Penn Station, which is the state's unofficial largest homeless shelter. You know, those folks doing a life sentence 30 days at a time in the municipal courts. You know, it was a conveyor belt of justice, but really, it was a conveyor belt of injustice. And I get into this court and I decide I have to do something. This has to be a meaningful process for the folks who are coming through this courthouse. And I decided that I am going to increase the public's trust. Ha, huh, is what most of my colleagues said. <laughs> you know, and really, the, the public had no reason to trust us. At best, we were terrible bill collectors who imposed fines that we knew people couldn't pay when we imposed them. It was as if the green monster was setting you up, lurking behind every corner, and as soon as you made one mistake, gotcha. And fortunately, uh, my, as my father would say, I am hard-headed, for those of you who know the rest of that sentence, what a hard head leads to. I am also not easily dissuaded from something that I set my mind to. And fortunately for us, um, the city of Newark decided that Newarkers deserve better, so they partnered with the Center for Court Innovation. Uh, then Mayor, now Senator Cory Booker, partnered with them and we decided that we would have a community court and a youth court. The best part of what they did, and we're in this theme of taking back, the city taking back its um, right to the city, is that the first thing they did was they went into the community and had hearings. They had hearings and asked the citizens of Newark, what do you want justice to look like? So we didn't impose this structure of justice. What surprised me the most was that the citizens said, I want those young boys on the corner to have jobs. I want the guy who nods out in front of my house to get drug treatment. What I expected was that the folks were going to say, I want them to sit in jail. I want greater penalties for them. But in fact, what they wanted was for them to get help and that the court should be the person helping them. And so in our partnership, we came up with the community court. And the community court provides alternative sanctions alternative sentencing for defendants who would otherwise get jail time. Now they get alternative, they get uh, social services, so they get counseling sessions, they get punishment with assistance, where they also are doing meaningful community service, where we have partnered with community nonprofits. And when we're done, when they're done with their mandates, not only do we get rid of the money that they owe that we know they can't pay, but they're now connected with community providers who've been doing this work in the community for years. We also have a youth court. And what's been awesome about the youth court is that we now have an opportunity to have the school district send their disciplinary problems to the courthouse where a group of high school students who've been trained to have hearings on the cases of their peers. Now the school district doesn't have to continuously suspend their students because of their zero tolerance policies. Now what they do is they accept the sanction of the students. And we use positive peer pressure to change their behavior because now the kids who are running the youth court are now training and doing community service with the other kids who get into trouble. What's been really key about this is that it also gives the police department an opportunity to do meaningful station house adjustments. For those of you who don't know, police officers have the opportunity when they pick up young people to make what's called a station house adjustment. They can process them through the legal system or they can send them to nonprofits in the community and accept that. And so that was the first level of what we did. The second thing that I did personally was use procedural justice when um, dealing with people who came through the courthouse. And not just the defendants, but defendants and their families and everyone else. And I insisted that the people in my courtroom treated everyone with dignity and respect because that's what procedural justice, procedural fairness is about. It's that if people perceive that they are treated with dignity and respect 
by the justice system and they're treated fairly by the justice system, not only do they comply with the court's orders, but they also comply with the law. And they're also satisfied with the court's decisions. And that's human decency, we would think. And so we began to practice this. And as the head of the courtroom, I made sure that everyone did this. This included police officers, prosecutors, and public defenders. Because we needed to have a transformational impact on the people who came before us. And then the third thing that we did, and especially for a judge, was aggressively become engaged in the community. Now that meant going out into the community as a judge. So you will see Judge Pratt at the community eateries downtown, at Penn Station, stopping, hey, hey, what you doing down here? You know I don't like you in this space. I know exactly what goes on on this block, so I don't want to see you there when you come back to court, right? Because now you have a judge who's not only saying, directing you to behave a particular way so that you don't get in trouble, but saying, this is my community as well. That's why I don't want all this foolishness on this corner, because I use this space. And what that means when your judge sees you outside. And you know, I, I laugh because people say, oh, you know, that's soft on crime. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm known as Judge Pratt don't play. <laughs> but the reality is, she's tough, but she cares about you. And what that translates to. Because the court must be a good institutional neighbor that contributes and changes and improves the lives of the people that they serve. Because that is what the court should be. Especially since what's been happening, and I like to, be, I like to hold my legislators' feet to the fire. We're spending a lot of time criminalizing behavior that get, annoys us. And y'all not, but you're electing them. It's true. I, I have worked in the legislative, the executive branch. People come to work and they're like, oh, I saw a homeless person in the park today. Let's legislate that. And nobody shows up at the hearings to talk about why that shouldn't be law. And then they send it to court. So now what's happening is that the judge is being asked to apply a criminal justice approach to a social problem. And so not to just belabor, but it, 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 it's those things that, um, really bring the community. And when I say bring the community, I did something that um, after I did it, I was like, wow, was that foolish. They asked me if they could do a survey of the citizens who come through the court about the court's service. And I was like, sure, go do that. Now, anybody ever do a survey, survey, employee survey? You know, you take a hit the first time you ask people because you've never asked them before. And so the survey came back, and it was honest. Because really serving the community means being willing, one, to go into the community, but to also be open to letting the community come in. We have a community advisory board where we have to sit there and listen to what it is the community is saying that we're doing well and that we're not doing well. The survey was important most recently because we did this survey and then we did a convening where in the morning we had academics, we had community members and organizations meet. And then in the afternoon we had judges, prosecutor, the prosecutor, and police officers, we have 26 law enforcement agencies in the city of Newark who write summonses and complaints. That means that if you are in the city of Newark, your chances of engaging with law enforcement are great, right? And so we also have to be conscious of that when you're looking at arrests. Well, yeah, if you have 26 agencies that might do this. One of the um, things that came out of the survey, one young man said, my man got shot and killed and they left him in the street like he wasn't nothing. He just laid there for hours. When we read this, the prosecutor and the public defender, the prosecutor actually and the police officers lowered their head. And when they began to talk about that, they were like, when we arrive on the scene, if the person's DOA, we can't move them. We would love to be able to move them, but we also can't move them because we have to take pictures of the crime scene and all these things. And one of the questions was, have you ever communicated this to the community? Nope. And so we began to talk about how do we fix this thing. Like this was one major thing that was really impacting community and justice relationship. And I have to tell you, I'm so proud. Uh, just this month we found out um, the nonprofit, the Center for Court Innovation, partnered with the prosecutor's office and they just won a federal grant to create a three-year position for a person who will show up on the scene to just deal with family members of loved ones explaining what's happening. They're not a police officer, they're not a prosecutor, but serving the loved ones. And so those are things that the community is entitled to. But until we begin to open up 
communication. And I think that the court is the best place to do this. I realized when I um, would host a meeting, when you said chief judge, people show up. And so using the courthouse as a place that people don't just receive punishment, but that it's a place that you can go to for assistance. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's a great um, contrast to really find um, a public official who is uh, actively and affirmatively looking for community engagement. Um, and I, you know, I, I think what you said about being uh, Judge Pratt, don't play. Uh, it takes a tough person to act with dignity and respect, especially when. <laughs> All of us are juggling more things than we probably should be. I wonder if the rest of you wanted to, to follow up on examples of when you feel like the public sector has been, responded to this engagement, this community engagement. You know, I, I know we've had um, times and, and people have talked about things that, um, from beginning with Professor Gillette's talk about, you know, the um, stand in front of the bulldozers, but I mean, I think there are. I'd like to think that we're in an era where there's some Judge Pratt's out there that we can um, engage in this transformation to make these systems a little more responsive, the public sector systems, responsive to our communities. I can take a, a stab at that. Um, take it any way you want. <laughs> sure. And it's, you know, it's a mixed bag, of course. Okay. I do think in, in Oakland and in Berkeley we see some positive steps. And I just want to say to folks, Oakland is not what you think it is, and Berkeley is definitely not what you think it is. <laughs> One of my friends who lives in Berkeley he describes it as like, he's like, Oakland is the place, I mean, Berkeley is the place where the hippies stayed and they got old and they bought homes and they got mean. <laughs> and like, ooh, Berkeley City Council meetings, just don't go if you want to have faith in humanity, I'm telling you. Um, but, you know, there are, we, we have been able to, you know, my, so my organization, one of the things we got started at um, uh, in the 80s, after the 89 Loma Prieta earthquake, one of the things that East Bay Housing Organizations did was to try and get the single room occupancy hotels in Oakland, you know, that housing of last resort for very poor folks, usually men in urban areas, try to get as many of those um, hotels that were damaged by the quake into the hands of nonprofit organizations that would then hold them down as affordable housing, and some of them are still that way. Um, just last week, we actually had a victory where we did convince the city council, led by one city council member, to put some regulations in place to save the last of those SROs in Oakland, which now, instead of, you know, in the late 80s, it was, well, if they need some fixing up, they're just going to, let's just demolish them. Now, those, um, you know, investors have their eyes on those last few SRO hotels to spruce them up as micro-unit housing for tech workers, commuting from San Francisco. And so we just got some regulations passed to make it very difficult to convert those. And we did that by working with that council members and the other for a long, a long amount of time. And that council member, it's interesting, we've had a lot of discussions today about how race and class intersect in the political class in DC in particular. Oakland, same thing. I gotta say, and I'm sorry to say it, um, that some of our most difficult council members on the Oakland City Council members are African American council members. And one of them was saying to me in a meeting, she was like, Gloria, when do my constituents in West Oakland when do my black homeowner constituents get to be NIMBYs like the white folks in the hills? And on the <laughs> one hand, that is a totally understandable feeling, right? Like, why do my folks who have been holding it down through all this disinvestment, when do we get to, when do we get to reap some of the spoils? When do we get to say no to affordable housing? Those things that people in the hills have been saying no to for decades, right? I understand where that comes from, but I'm like, really, that is your aspiration? Your vision of what wealth building and what becoming a black homeowner means is to be able to meet out the same exclusion that white folks, I mean, like, what? <laughs> but at the same time, we were able to convince her on this one issue. Yeah, I want to build on that point by telling a, a, a true story about these situations. Um, when Muriel Bowser first got into office, <laughs> yeah, keep, a little louder. <laughs> Uh, we, we actually had a, a real good experience with Muriel Bowser. It was Rosemary and another organizers with tenant leaders. We actually went into the mayor's office, actually edited some documents, right, that would keep people in Shaw for like another seven to 10 years at what we call low cost housing, meaning affordable, right, not the fake affordable. But then once that happened, they think we sold our soul, right? 
And, it, and it shouldn't happen that way. Just because you're doing your job, especially with other black people, a black leader shouldn't expect us to just give in to everything. You see, so I think that's part of the, the tension that I was mentioning earlier, that if you want a, a just city, you know, you, you can't bait and switch, right? You, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't say we want justice, but we want to mistreat some, some people sometimes, right? Who happen to be, to be black, poor, and female, right? So I think those are the real critical things that I'm trying to get us to examine as I examine them myself, right? So that's why the politics with one DC is real difficult because recently we bought a building around the corner of the Black Worker Center at 2500 Martin Luther King Avenue. And a lot of people in the room helped make that happen. And we even got a $400,000 government grant, the most money we ever got. And, and we try to remind them just because we got the grant, we understand it's public money, which just means it's our tax dollars, which means we're free, right? And we can criticize the government, you know, because the only way we're going to get a just city is to critique the system that we're in, because we got a long way to go to get to a just city, right? So that's why that's a difficult question for moment. And, and what we're trying to present ourselves is not to be righteous, but to be honest about how difficult it is. And we're not going to let you use us as trade bait for some one little project when we got a whole city where 40,000 black people have been removed from decade after decade, which is a bigger issue for us to confront, right? So in terms of putting a finer point on this idea of public investment, can folks join me? So, you know, I, mean, I think there's this narrative that there is no public investment in certain neighborhoods or in communities, but actually the state is deeply invested in these neighborhoods, but it is invested in incarcerating people. So, you know, Eric Cadora has this you know, million dollar block study where you know, states are spending millions of dollars on certain blocks and it is um, to incarcerate individuals. Um, one of our partner organizations in Detroit, the Youth Development Organization, took in an informal poll of their membership of their teens. And uh, they found that 90% of the young people have incarcerated parents or parental figures. And so you know, we as Michigan are deeply invested in these families and it's in destruction of these families. And so I think um, you know, we need to get out of this idea that there's this scarcity all the time, when actually we are a nation of abundance. <laughs> you know, and we can afford everything we could dream up in terms of our wildest freedom dreams, but right now it's you know, deeply invested in criminal justice. And so there's some interesting work going on um, you know, in terms of grassroots organizing around divest, invest. Um, this is some work that we've been um, starting to push forward with our Just City Innovation Lab in Detroit. So um, we convened a Restorative Justice Youth Design Summit at the end of September. Um, so Wayne County is um, trying to build a new $533 million justice complex that includes a new adult jail and a new youth jail. And so we brought together youth organizers who already worked on school to prison pipeline issues, education justice issues, and said, how could we spend half a billion dollars <laughs> on your community um, that would make you feel safe and valued and empowered? And they had incredible ideas. Um, a few of them, they said, you know, we want transit that runs from the east to west side of the city. We want our teachers to be well paid. We want clean running water in our schools because they don't have it right now. Um, they wanted mental health spas, uh, which is this beautiful idea. They had designed it down to the paint color in terms of what would be most soothing. Um, areas for individual therapy, group therapy, relaxation, um, and none of them set a jail. And so I, I think it's beautiful that young people, particularly young people who use public space more than adults do, um, you know, they're the ones who spend eight hours a day at a school. They, you know, they can't go to bars, so they're you know, in public spaces, they're in parks, they're in basketball courts, they're walking down the street, they're not driving. Um, so I think that they have a disproportionate, um, because they use public space so much more, um, we should be listening to them more when it comes to designing solutions. And so that was work that we did in partnership with Designing Justice, Designing Spaces, which is out of Oakland, um, which does a lot of design work around the country in terms of designing restorative justice centers. Um, they talk about the fact that for one jail, for the cost of one jail, we could design 30 restorative justice centers at every corner of a city. Um, so just thinking about, yes, we're deeply invested in certain directions, but how could we um, fight against that investment and reinvest in other things? You know, we have a long history of bad investments. So just because <laughs> we're not necessarily investing in the right things. I mean, 
Yeah, I mean, a jail is a micro unit, you know, and a, and a terrible uh, outcome. Um, can I, so why don't can we, I, I'm sorry, can I add sure. to that? Um, D.C. is really, though, in the forefront of juvenile justice reform models with their credible, with, with what's going on with the Division of Youth and Family Services. I've been doing some work down here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where um, the Credible Messengers program where they're using formerly incarcerated individuals, training them, and they're being assigned to young people in um, director Clinton Lacey actually has the authority that when a kid is sentenced to one of his facilities to say, no, this kid is going to go into one of the community facilities, which is actually going to go back home, and they get a credible messenger, but so does the parent. So we're working on the entire family here. And so this is really a, a model that's really helped D.C. reduce um, the number of children who are being held, as well as changing, um, I think they recently changed a truancy law where kids who got picked up for being truant, imagine they went to jail as opposed to sending them to go to school, and it's tr literally emptied out the jails here, but also giving these children the skills that they need. So um, DC really is a model for um, reforming the juvenile justice system and really seeing some good results. We love to hear that. Uh, so let's hear for your questions. Um, uh, <coughs> We have microphones, or I'll let you pass them out there. Hi, Tony Gualtieri. Uh, I don't know what to say. I do. I'm around, <laughs> ally. I don't know whatever. Okay. Uh, my questions. I'm trying to do this. Trying to trying to think about how to frame this in a way that's not confrontational or anything like bad <laughs> about that. Because it's about Lisk, the Bridge Park, the Land Community Land Trust, and the area here, and relates back to the museum. Feel free. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and also for the judge. Uh, so while I appreciate that LISC and other organizations and come on and other people, even the museum with the little park lots and whatnot is invested in a bridge park that will metaphorically and literally connect the two sides and connect the communities and provide a, you know, theoretically a great place that's a public space that's beautiful and all that. Uh, my, con my concern is like how do organizers get on top of that stuff ahead of time? Because once they announce there's a bridge park going to be there, uh, gentrification is not even an issue because it's the, the prices down the street, they were, they were advertising the Lemon Street Bridge Park is coming the instant on, on the houses in Fairlawn, the instant it was even announced before Lisk got anything was even necessarily involved and Scott Kratz first was talking about it. So how do people like Dominic, I know you got to do amazing work and Empower DC people left already. They had to go back to organizing. But how do people get ahead of that that's my first thing. How do they get ahead of these things? Do they have to have some dork like me sitting around looking at PUDs or something or talking to some other people so that we can know ahead of time? Because once something's announced, speculation's through the roof. Houses jumped right through the roof, right? Then people start selling. They weren't accepting vouchers anymore, such like that. But I guess my more important question is for the judge, okay, uh, since D.C. and a lot of places, judges aren't necessarily picked by the population, right? It's picked by Congress, or sorry, Senate, President, and other random orange people, or whatever. Uh, how do how do we, as people, you know, uh, work with others like Dominic to ensure that the, the legal process is followed through? Because the Berry Farms development is going on now. The stuff that's not being knocked down is because it's held up in court. Because one judge out of every single one in DC finally decided to do something ethical when they when she looked at the actual process. They're not. DC's got laws, got very strong laws. We'll talk about renting and uh, renting and topo and everything else about that. Very progressive laws. The zoning does not do a single thing. Okay, every single time a case goes before for redevelopment of a public housing place or anything like that, or anything, particularly as public housing or affordable housing unit, done, done deal, already gone through. They, Mayor Williams, Mayor Williams said Temple Courts could be a place for new communities initiative when there was a covenant on it. From, from the HUD and federal government before that. That's not even due, pro, due diligence done. Okay. So what do people do to make stuff like this happen and work with necessarily their judges to make sure that the government actually follows through on due process? Okay, um, well, I guess I'll take the first part. So uh, you know, I'm not sure how, um, how much you know about this, but this is uh, an historic Anacostia. It's a small uh, neighborhood. Well, actually, we work on both sides of the river, but I mean, I think there's, a set, there's actually an aspect of equitable recreational space. I mean, you look at the way the city is invested in park space and the Georgetown waterfront, which used to be a, where you store the snow plows, I guess, right down there. And now it's a lovely multi-million dollar park. There's Yards Park. Um, so I think it, there's a fairness aspect, which 
if we're going to invest in those kinds of public amenities, we ought to um, tie in communities east of the river. But I think the more important a answer really is that um, you do what you can, frankly. You know, we had this really broad engagement process that Building Bridges Across the River did, and they re, re upped their uh, community engagement plan a second time. I mean, I think, you know, you, for us, as, an, as a, we're seeking to preserve affordable housing, I mean, it's, it's transaction by transaction. So we've got a new proposal for a, a 15 unit building in Fairlawn that we're going to, you know, help the, the owner con preserve his affordable housing, but it's, it's granular. You know, so the professors will come back in a few decades and say that we blew it or something, but it's all we can do now is help every, every parcel you can do. And I think that's why you need these organizers is because they unearth more grains that you can work with. So, I mean, I think that's, that's sort of my, my take, frankly. Dominic, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I do. So, thank you, Tony. So it is complex, and, and, but it's a great question. And, I knew it was going to come up today, so let me say this. I think the first issue is this. The Levin Street Bridge did create the Douglas Community Land Trust. So the question is, will the city and other financial institutions put enough resources in organizing, right, and helping people control land speculation Right, for the next 50 years, because we know that you got to say, if they're going to build the bridge, a lot of people are going to come. So what's the, what, what is the anti-displacement zone plan to be that frank about it, right? And be that aggressive about it, you know? And I think we don't do that. Like, so one DC, we met with Scott from the Lemon Street Bridge twice. We're trying to meet with the Scotland Workforce Development Center, so the Black Workers Center could work with them. We haven't met with them. But they get nervous when we raise these issues, right? Because their nervousness is about the fact that they started something that they know could go wrong, but 1DC does the same thing, right? We, we bought a building across the street from the Metro, so we're in the mix, but we're not af afraid when even some of our funders say, well, you know this building's going to be worth a lot. At some point, what are you going to do with, with that? I said, well, we look at the property and the capital differently, right? It's for the community. That's, that's what we're trying to figure out. And we're clear about that. We're not speculating, right? So I think that's the first part. The second part um, related to Burry Farm and, and all of this is that there's enough people in the city that knows, like, a recent neighbor, it's Trinidad, right, which is off of 8th Street. I'm a part of a fellowship. And the name of our project is called Making a Just City. And, and, it's, and in the third class is a woman that grew up in Trinidad, and she does restorative justice. So, so she's talking with us about doing restorative justice work in the Black Worker Center. But here's what we ended up talking about last night before I flew back from Minnesota this morning. She said they are terrified because their mother's house is next door to a house that's sold for $900,000. So you know those small houses in Trinidad? And 800000 And I said, well, we can help you figure this out. Right. So that's what I'm saying. The Levin Street Bridge folks and List folks know this is going to happen, but you got to you got to spend year, the time now to plan for the for the decades later, right? So, like y'all, when List started investing was 90% black, now it's 30% black, right? That doesn't have to happen, you know. But just like Rosemary said, even one DC was thinking lot by lot, building by building. Now we're thinking about the whole city, so the same thing should happen with Anacostia. What is the prevention plan, let's be honest about it, to keep black folks here and keep the workers here? You gotta be that honest about it. Okay. Okay, yeah, now you really stepping on some toes now. So. <laughs> Uh, Ari Terrasa, who is a native Washingtonian, and he's also a lawyer, he lives in Anacostia, he filed a lawsuit against the, the D.C. government for something that actually was teaching about, about six years ago. Um, and it's called the creative class. What he's trying to... I guess confront is that the D.C. government in their public documents and private documents make it clear that they're targeting a certain class of people 
with a certain demographic, with a certain income, and that's discriminatory, right? And so, uh, and some foundations, by the way, have signed on to this because if you look at the, the, the last 30 years in D.C., it's pretty clear, like, who they're marketing to, right? And, and, and so, once again, that's something that's impacting this whole discussion. But once again, Ari did that because he was part of the Burry Farm team, and he still is with One DC and Power DC, the tenants, and then met with, with the city about Burry Farms, and they wouldn't listen. So finally, he said, "Well, he's going to file a, a lawsuit against them." And, and and the lawsuit is about the whole city, not just about Burry Farms. Is that the city is changing because you're targeting certain people and, and put all your resources into those people rather than looking at Burry Farms as a place where the people want to stay. Maybe we, even if we tore it down, it should be a resident-led plan that. It, once again, it's designed for generations to keep the people there while the new people come. Okay. With respect to um, appointing judges, um, while you guys don't directly appoint judges, you elect the folks who appoint judges. Right. And if you work on campaigns, they should have a list of the people you want to be judges or what types of people. You want people who are sensitive to your community's needs. They need to understand that. Um, Raz Baraka ran on a platform of yeah. we are the mayor. and um, when I became the chief judge, I told my judges, people believe this. The citizens believe that they are the mayor, so they don't complain to me about the things you do. They go directly to the appointing body. And then people were surprised when he started putting people in their place. Mm -hmm. So you could have, I just, I think for me, you have more power than you know. Well, let's, let's yeah. Let's. Right, right. Your city, do you appoint your local, the, municipal? The, the principle, we have more, I think we have more power than we know. I think that's safe. <laughs> Judicial <laughs> power, we don't necessarily have. Let's, let's see if there's another question. Yeah, so, um, I, I don't know if I need the mic because you guys are I think, yeah, there's for yeah. the overflow. All right, so um, one of the uh, things about this panel is that often our communities are characterized by this sort of retributive violence. And I think in all of your sort of presentations, so give evidence to the sort of redemptive spirit of love that, that we have for our people, even just thinking about the surveys, et cetera. So I just think this panel is very beautiful for that reason. Um, I did want to ask about thinking about Barry Farm and, uh, as a public housing community, as well as this might apply to other housing communities. Uh, Barry Farm is surrounded by super fun sites as well as brownfield sites. It is one of the most toxic areas. Um, and when I was um, teaching at a uh, school, university in Baltimore brought students down, and I'll never forget that someone from GSA said, oh, we had to remove six uh, cubic tons of soil to a special landfill because it was contaminated with all kinds of carcinogens, right? And I know that this, these carcinogens and other sort of um, contaminants is affecting the groundwater. So Barry Farm and its residents essentially are, I don't know any other way to describe it, are petri dishes with evidence in their, in their very bodies of the toxicity that they have been exposed to. And so the question for Detroit, because when you were speaking, I thought about Flint, right, and, and the water, but also for the judge, how do we um, capture this and, and thinking about holding our local government accountable? How do, we, how do we do it when, in fact, displacement, which is slightly different from gentrification, right, um, is dispersing these people and then claiming to lose track of these residents? How do we collect these people and, and, and furnish that evidence of what they've been exposed to? In my site, I've had people die from cancer, heart attacks, strokes, I mean, at astronomical numbers. Anyway, thank you. Yeah, um, so I can speak to that a bit. I would point people to the work of Flint Rising. Um, can you all hear me? So um, again, that organization called Flint Rising is led by um, women like Nayira Sharif um, and others who um, have, you know, first they start off as kind of first responders to the, to the lead crisis. So they were making sure that people had um, water delivered to their homes when people were homebound and couldn't make it to distribution sites. Um, they're still making sure that people have, you know, access to uh, clean water and they realized that this is a manifestation of um, you know, certain power imbalances. And um, this is a symptom of much deeper problems. And so they have decided to start you know, going um, door to door, block to block to do organizing, building political power. 
um, to build towards whatever needs to be tackled next. Um, so that is one um, example that I would hold up in terms of the ways that people have taken um, you know, environmental, which is ultimately political crises, and taken as an uh, organizing opportunity. Um, and so I would kind of dig into some of the ways that they're framing these, these issues. Yeah, I don't know if I have a good answer for you. Um, what I've found in my community that even when people are displaced, they don't go far. They usually end up in neighboring, I mean, everybody goes to grandmas, right? But they also end up in neighboring urban cities around. And they're still somehow connected to what's happening in the place that displaced them. And so they're still around. There's still physically a way to touch them. Um, and, and so I don't know if that's a good answer for you um, in terms of physically having the body there again, as you're saying. I mean, local hospitals, especially if they're sick. I mean, in Newark, as you know, you know, everyone's at University Hospital, whether they live in Newark or not. But people don't, they tend to go back to those places or they go back to Lyons Avenue, St. Barnabas, wherever those places are. But, so that's why I'm not sure if I really have a good answer in terms of how to capture the people who are displaced because I find that they just don't leave. They don't really go far outside of the place that because they're still connected to it. That's interesting. I think in these hot market cities, um, we'll probably see a different pattern. You mm -hmm. know, and I think it's always been somewhat of the case in um, you know where if uh, someone did well, they would move off to a different community. You know, mm -hmm. if they were. Um, made it through the educational system and had a middle class income, they would move out to the suburbs. Now, you know, we talk a lot about your zip code being your destiny, um, but I think with the gentrification, it's less likely that that is the case. Your, the zip code you're born in very well may not be the one you can stay in unless you do extraordinarily well in your educational and so forth in your career. Hi, I'm Zach and T. Men's Cole. Hey, Amanda. Hi. Um, so I used to work in Detroit um, and dealt with a lot of these houses that were taken by Wayne County um, from people large, largely of color, right? And, um, and this is question is for you and also Judge Pratt, my boss, Courtney Bryan from Center for Community. Now my boss, but used to be at Center for yeah. Court Intubation, says Good hi. Um, so in these communities where there is deep neighborhood, neighborhood trauma, Right. Um, how do you position people even to begin to think about evoking their right to the city? Well, yeah. No. Um, one way is to propose some, the wrong thing, and then you, the community turns out for yeah. that. <laughs> I think one but of the questions: How do you get yeah, them to turn out you, for the right thing? Yeah, I think you have to make them aware of their trauma. Yeah. I mean, fortunately. In my courthouse, in the courthouse, we have social workers on staff who use um, trauma-based uh, counseling. But talking about trauma and having them understand that they have been subjected to trauma. I've been doing some work at um, Pelican Bay Prison, and I understood trauma, but then I really understood trauma when I went to the prison. And I was working with some of the guys, and one of the things that I learned as they talked about the worst things that happened to them was that all of them had experienced a violent, traumatic death at a very young age. And so I realized, I'm like, these are the kids that you see when the television cameras come by who are standing in the background. And nobody does anything about the fact that I saw grandma or dad killed in these spaces. And so maybe really building what we were able to do is build up a lot of capacity in some of our nonprofits to deal with this idea that people are dealing with trauma. So when they're coming into the court, I understand that. I understand that trauma could be you got an eviction notice today. Because if a person gets an eviction notice, nothing else matters in their lives. Even if they're facing like, you're about to go to jail because you did. And they just come to court with this piece of paper. And so um, speaking and teaching them about trauma, but that even in the face of trauma, they have to do, they have to um, fight for their right to the city. Because by the time they realize they're traumatized, they've, lost, they've been displaced. And I think we, we, we as a community really don't have time to wait and I don't think that even the communities never waited. You know, the communities had their problems and continued to work through it. So I think it's really just educating people and at the school level as well. I mean, what we do at, we, we punish kids because they come to school and they act out. Yeah, somebody just got shot on my black block last night. You know, and we don't understand that we don't deal with the real issue. We're just dealing with, you know, the, the, the side effect of a shooting that happened in my neighborhood and I'm scared. That's what I am. I'm scared all the time. So I 
say, I mean, this is one of the beauties that I found of organizing at the intersection of criminal justice, restorative justice, economic development, community building, is that there are these techniques that you can use in these different fields. Um, so I, when you thought of the, um, when you brought up the trauma question, I think to restorative justice, where we know that in order to deal with a traumatic event, one of the most important things for a survivor to be able to heal is to put together a coherent narrative of what's happened to them. And that's precisely why our existing system is so awful and leaves people completely traumatized, is because we don't allow people to get a clear a sense of what happened and why. It's all about you know, getting a verdict, suppressing the evidence, you know, not letting someone take the stand, never getting a coherent story of what happened. Yeah. And so that's the beauty of restorative justice, is it allows people to piece together why this happened to them so that they can heal. And I think there's a corollary with community organizing and building power. So letting someone know, why did this happen to me? This has been a huge part of what's been happening around the tax foreclosure crisis in Detroit, mm -hmm. is someone saying, you know, they were being accused by public officials of losing their homes because they wanted to, literally they said, you spent your money on purses instead of paying your tax bill, which is horrific. It's based on all sorts of racist, racist and gendered stereotypes. But as soon as people were able to come to a public forum that the Coalition Against Unconstitutional, Unconstitutional Tax Foreclosures uh, called, they said, wait, it wasn't just happening to me. This happened to tens of thousands of people across the city, and it's because of these structural reasons. Then they're able to get beyond the stigma and shame and move towards building power together and recognizing the systems behind what had happened to them. And that, over the past year and a half, has bloomed into some beautiful organizing to the point where um, we, um, the coalition recently had a dignity restoration housing program launch where they're getting people back into homes. Um, they're saying you know, it, you know, it's, it's about um, reparations, so the fact that people lost their homes um, through you know, unconstitutional, um, illegal processes, they're now entitled to have their dignity restored by getting into a new home. Um, so it's, it's you know, led to some, some beautiful things. I think, yes, go to the core of giving, getting a coherent narrative of why this happened. I think it's also, we, we do a lot of work with storytelling as well. A lot of our folks in our organizing program, what they'll do when they go to city councils, they will tell their story of like, if you pass this policy, other people will have the ho home that I do. If you don't, other people are literally going to die, actually. Like, like the, the housing crisis is not a matter of like, it, I mean, it's a matter of, of life and death. But what we have learned in our work of doing organizing, and I, I think, Amanda, your work kind of touches on this, is that you cannot make the storytelling process transactional because then you are just inviting people to relive yeah. their trauma on a public stage for, to, to win a, a policy. And that's just wrong and perpetuating the hurt. And so trying to make sure that before and after people are sharing their stories publicly, that they are surrounded by their community of fellow organizers and fellow leaders, and they know they've told that story to someone they trust first. They've, they, you know, they've, they've, heard, they've had other things that they can talk about before they're getting up there and burying their soul, because it is no small thing to relive your trauma, even if you are trying to save others from that trauma. So I think having those structures in place is really important. I think, um, you know, I think the sense I had was, you know, you talk about violence, and this, but. Well, I think what one thing that really hasn't come up is the, the, the status of immigrants and immigration as an issue. I mean, my son was here a little earlier. I guess he split. Um, but, you know, he's a th fourth grader, and, you know, he's sitting with this kid, and he's like, you know, his dad was deported that morning, you know? And he, the kid got sent off to school. Like, what else, what else is the mom going to do? You know, we, we had a, a tenant purchase, a cooperative that we're working with. Um, always go to meet with them. I try to speak in Spanish. My Spanish is not that good. But I can understand what they're saying, and I they would I asked them why do you want to do why do you want to buy this building up in um, in uh, Brightwood neighborhood, and they didn't get anything out of it. And I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, why are they not saying anything? And then they start to t then you know we asked it a second time after we discussed some other things, and they said, you know, the prior landlord called immigration on us. At, at the, 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 I showed up. At, this was few, this is before Trump. Um, it said immigration showed up at four in the morning. I came home with my night job with my toddler and they knocked over my kid. And then they, they went to the board president of the tenant association and they searched all the documents. They found out everybody's legal, you know? So it, it's almost like that trauma was their motivation for taking on the responsibility of making a loan from us, applying to the city, managing their cooperative going forward. It's, and it was the community, it was a collective action supported by nonprofit, funded by government, et cetera. But it, it is something I think uh, that we're gonna see a lot more anxiety and, and, and trauma in these immigrant communities.
question back. <laughs> Actually, unfortunately, I'm really sorry no. to, to have to cut off the conversation at this moment, but um, <clears throat> hang tight for, for, for a few moments. But first, let's give our uh, concluding panel a, a, a round of applause for their important work. Um, please, please hang tight as here as well. Um, we have also, um, before you move, some, some uh, kind of uh, final reflections. Um, and also, I'll make some final concluding remarks. But for our final reflections, I wanted to invite um, to the podium um, to Conti Menz Cole, uh, who uh, has served in a variety of roles that I think will offer um, uh, some important, interesting perspectives on, on the conversations we've been having today. Um, she's currently Vice President uh, for Mid-Atlantic at J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase Global Philanthropy, overseeing strategic grant making in the greater Washington region. Uh, she's an economic and community development practitioner uh, who has worked on the ground in the country's uh, most distressed communities. Uh, prior to joining J.P. Morgan, uh, she served as director of policy at the Center for Community Progress, a national nonprofit based in Flint, Michigan, that equips communities uh, with the tools and resources needed to effectively address abandonment, blight, and vacancy. Additionally, she served as deputy director at the Detroit Land Bank Authority, uh, the country's largest land bank, and as a fellow with uh, the White House Strong City, Strong Communities Initiative embedded in, in the city of Detroit. Uh, she brings international experience and best practices to her grant-making role, having previously worked on local e economic development projects in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Um, and she holds an MSc from the London School of Economics and Urban Regeneration and Affordable Housing and a JD from Georgetown Law Center, uh, in addition to a BA uh, from the University of Miami in International Studies and Economics. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dakanti Men Coles. Hi, um, good afternoon. Um, I, I know I'm standing between you and some refreshments, and I heard the fajitas were legendary at lunchtime. Um, so I won't keep you. Um, I've been incredibly inspired by the sessions that I've been able to attend. Um, and as Samir mentioned, my name is Deccan T. Men's Cole. I currently um, work at J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation, um, and I serve as grant maker for the uh, Mid-Atlantic region. Um, as you, and as you also heard, I'm a community development practitioner that snuck into a bank. Um, and before I entered this role, I worked um, really in communities where there was a crisis. Detroit during the bankruptcy, Flint after the water crisis, and also helping thinking about housing strategy in Baltimore after um, Freddie Gate Gray's death and the uprising. Um, and in each of these communities um, that I worked, I want, I, what I know for sure is that neighborhoods do not simply change by the people who show up and claim that it's a new day, right? Um, as you heard throughout this day and from our panelists as well, um, and what the exhibit aptly highlighted was that communities are transformed by the residents who have been there and made the way for, new, for revitalization and new opportunity. And it's advocates that you, um, that really allow for this to happen. So um, there was a lot said. Um, so my summation is really going to focus on takeaways that I'm going to take with me, and I'd love to hear from you guys um, during the reception if there is more that you think I should um, add to this list. Um, and number one is that history is an honest judge. And if you take a look at, um, at the exhibit and what's happened in the city, um, we can recognize that there were clear policies and practices that push, pushed residents further and further east and really out of the city. Um, but what is inspiring is that there are real tools that we can tap into that prevents displacement. Um, and if that we have the foresight, if we actually allow for what I heard folks refer to as supporting visionary um, organizing, um, that's not simply responsible, but really sets the bl blueprint for equitable development that we have a, more of a chance, right? More of a chance to prevent displacement. Um, I also think that we can think beyond um, just the tools that we exist, we have around affordable housing and think about justice housing. Housing that really truly recognizes that um, it's not just about what you can afford, but what you have access to in terms of education, in terms of access to transport, in terms of healthy food outlets. Um, and that 
um, in supporting housing that is affordable for individuals, we need to also um, support housing that's truly accessible. Um, I also um, heard a lot about how we can think about our commercial corridors very differently as well and recognize the displacement of quickly gentrifying um, LMI corridors or low and moderate income corridors that have seen an influx of investment such as what you see at MLK and Good Hope or Minnesota and Benning currently. Um, and we can do this through thinking about policies but also supporting um, entrepreneurs that have been in the community to continue to preserve and position them for greater success and also supporting them to take advantage of the influx of capital that's coming into this community as well. Um, uh, I also heard about the right to the city is not just about um, housing and land, we also have to talk about resources and access to capital. And that's what I think is um, being now positioned at a bank is truly important to really think about our, our private partnerships and our public partnerships in a way that in ensures um, access to capital. Um, and it was really, um, it was really hot, it was, it really opened my eyes to hear about how we really need to think about a real reentry for justice-involved individuals that just doesn't think about, um, you know, often focused on workforce, but really recognizes the need for the reintegration into their families, into housing, into their communities. Um, and I, I find this, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's, um, it means a great deal to me and to um, my firm to be invited in this room because um, we want to be seen as partners and we want your partnership. And, um, and I thank you for your willingness to help us get us right as, as the firm expands in this um, city and in this region. And um, so I did want to actually highlight a few things that we're working on and I'd love to hear from you during the reception how we can do better and we can make sure that our resources are targeted effectively. Um, we are looking to commit 500 million in terms of lending for affordable housing um, within the region um, and um, 4 billion in lending for home mortgages and small business more generally. Um, and this includes the doubling of our philanthropic investment regionally to 25 million over the next five years. Um, we've tried to do quite a bit of listening and be reflective about our approach, and this includes everything from not just our philanthropic effort, but also how we think about our workforce, as well as who's, um, who's building um, the, the branches and who's providing the, uh, who are the suppliers and contractors on our properties as well. Um, I, just a few things that I think, in particularly in DC, that we're supporting that I think might be um, interesting to continue the conversation is number one, we're supporting small businesses along the MLK, along the MLK and Good Hope corridor, as well as uh, Minnesota and Benning corridor, to make sure that they are stay in place because our branches are part of that changing landscape, and we want to make sure that we're connecting um, those small, long-standing, long, -standing long um, small businesses with the resources that they need to stay in place and prosper. Um, we're also working with the Douglas Land Trust to really think through how this um, unique community land trust model could be scaled, um, not just with public resources, but with private and philanthropic resources, and what's the best way in which we can plug in. Um, and alongside our partners LISC, we're co-funding um, housing counseling services who are really educating and providing tenant advocacy so that more small unit building tenants are well positioned to evoke their TOPA or tenant opportunity to purchase act right, uh, rights when um, initiated. And um, so we're deeply proud to be a part of the city and our partnership with residents and organizations. And I really look forward to working together to line our efforts to address and lift up people who are being left behind. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for those remarks. Um, as we move into the reception, I just wanted to um, offer um, a truly, truly genuine thanks uh, to our amazing speakers uh, who traveled from both near and far uh, to be in conversation with us today. And I hope extend in really important and meaningful ways uh, the kinds of conversations that we hoped to begin uh, with our Right to the City exhibition. Um, and so in that spirit, um, I want to mention 
that we're newly launching um, a bi-monthly conversation series, a Right to the City conversation series, where we'll be bringing together, uh, in the spirit of this day's conversations, um, important um, folks doing work on the front lines on a range of these issues that, that have been brought up today. Uh, and the first of those uh, conversations will be on Saturday, December 8th. And some more of those details are on the last page of, of your program. Um, I also want to mention that our exhibition, Right to the City, um, will be open through April uh, 2020. Uh, so you have time not just to visit once, but twice and many more times and bring your friends and family to, to um, enjoy it as well. And lastly, just would like to mention um, and offer a genuine thanks to all of you who've taken time out of your uh, day to, to join us for these conversations because ultimately we want these conversations to not be monologues but dialogues, right? Um, to have people at the table um, so that we can be uh, bringing as many heads to the table to really think through these deeply complicated but incredibly important issues that are reshaping the communities that we live in. Um, so really just thank you all um, and join me in thanking not only our panelists but all of you for coming here. So thank you.